All right, well, uh, good morning, and once again, welcome to uh, Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. If you're joining us here in person or you're watching via the live stream, or maybe you come across this video at a later time, I want to thank you for taking some time out of your day to come here and, um, and to worship the Lord together. And then in just a minute, we'll uh, get into the Word together. Uh, but before we do that, as always, we want to know how everybody is doing. If you're here in person, in the back, there against the wall, we have some white uh, note cards. If you have any prayer requests, any praise reports, anything like that you want to share with the church, you can fill those out, put them in the Agatha box, or give those to us personally. And um, if you need prayer, anything like that, you know, we're here to, to serve one another. So just let us know. And um, if you're watching via the live stream, um, I do want to encourage you to visit our church website at fbccelt.com. And if you go to our website, it looks like this. So we have it pulled up here. And um, if you go to the site menu there, it'll give you a nice table of contents um, for our website. So if you're interested in any information like our statement of faith, our vision um, statement, anything like that, or a vision or a mission here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, you can uh, check those things out there. And then also if you want to learn more about our senior pastor, Pastor Angel, you can uh, click on that tab there as well. But I do want to direct you to our media tab. If you click on that tab there, it'll take you to all of our... Um, our media sites there, iTunes Podcast, SoundCloud, YouTube, all of the past studies, all the current studies are there free of charge. And we do want to encourage you all to uh, hear those, listen to those, and maybe share those if the Lord's leading you on your own personal social media platform. We do want to encourage you guys to spread the gospel by sharing these messages. And um, when you think about social media right now, it's, um, it's really not being used for God's glory. It's being used a lot for division and um, just to cause confusion and stir up of the world. So we want to make sure that the gospel is being channeled through just many, many different avenues um, as we possibly can. So if you go back to the site menu, and um, let's say you want to get in contact with us during the week, you can click the um, contact us link, and it'll take you to the middle of the web page here. And uh, this is like one of those electronic versions of that white note card that we have here if you're in person. You can fill that out, and we'll get back to you um, as soon as possible. And then if you go down a little bit, there is a, yeah, there it is. So there is our meeting address, also our email address, our service time, our phone number. And um, if you want to get in contact with us during the week, you can um, you can certainly uh, email us or call us and we will get back to you. And um, here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, we don't have a formal offering. Um, however, as the Lord leads you to give, we do have the agape box in the back. You could also mail your tithes and offerings to the church if you desire. And if you want to give electronically, we do have that option on the website. If you go to the online giving, there's a link there to PayPal. And if you're watching via the live stream um, or any of our other social media uh, sites, uh, that link is um, down below in the video description. So you can click on that and donate as the Lord leads you. And of course, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. You don't want to give grudgingly or, or forcefully. Um, but I will tell you that all the donations, everything that is given to the church, is used solely for the purposes of pointing people to Jesus and uh, building the Lord's kingdom. So once again, the website has a lot of information. Um, if you want to check that out a little bit later today, you can do that. And um, hopefully we can answer your questions through there. Or if not, you can reach out to us. Uh, we're here to serve you. And um, just some general announcements for the week. Uh, the men will be gathering here on Wednesday, Wednesday. at uh, 6.30 p.m. And uh, we are currently going through the book of Genesis. So uh, we gather for a time of fellowship. We also share a meal together. And then we get into the Word together. So if you're interested in the men's study, you want to get connected in that way, uh, visit us at 6.30 Wednesday evening here at the church. You can contact the church or um, you can just show up. We're here and uh, we, we're looking forward to meeting you. If that's uh, where the Lord's putting on your heart to, to visit our church. Also, um, we have a youth ministry that meets right after announcements, middle school, high school age, um, young people. And if you're looking for a ministry to connect with, I do want to encourage you to visit Unashamed Ministry, um, youth ministry here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We're currently going through the Gospel of Luke, and um, we're also planning um, our monthly outing. I think we're going to be doing something at Western Playland. I'll have some more details on that for you, I guess, before they close it. I'm not sure if they even close it. They might close it, right, probably in November or something. Um, and I know you, you all have started school already, but um, we do want to continue fellowshipping and growing in the Lord together as, um, as the Lord leads us. 
And then we also have children's ministry that meets right after the announcements as well. If you have small children, maybe that's keeping you from coming to church. Uh, don't let that be a hindrance. Bring them with you. Bring everybody with you to church. And we'll have a place for them uh, to fellowship and also to learn about the Lord. Okay. And um, I think that's the extent of the announcements. Once again, if you could just keep um, all the families that are traveling um, in your prayers, that the Lord would grant them traveling grace as they come back to um, El Paso. And um, of course, Pastor Angel and his family, keep them in your prayers um, as well. So, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, Pastor Angel and um, his family are out of town, so he's asked me to, to teach this morning. So uh, we'll go ahead and, um, and get into that. Uh, so this morning, uh, we will be in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 17. And we'll go into chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And um, the title of the message this morning is um, Living Letters. Living Letters letters. So before we get into the study, let me go ahead and pray once more, and then we'll look at the word uh, together uh, this morning. Well, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for uh, this morning, Lord, this time together as we came here and to worship you. It's just a beautiful time. And we just thank you that you know, on this Labor Day weekend, we can come here, Lord, and we can just rest in your peace, Lord. We can rest in your peace always. And we thank you, Lord, that we have that hope, we have that future. And this morning, Lord, as we get into your word, we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, that your word would pierce our hearts, it would become flesh, it would land on good soil, Lord, it would change us. And uh, we just pray that you would just use your word this morning, that your spirit would fill this place, it would fill us individually, and um, we would leave different from how we came in here. We thank you so much for your love and for your mercy and for your son, Jesus. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's a guy that um, I've been following on social media, um, on Instagram, and maybe you've heard of him, maybe you're following him as well, but his account is called uh, Church Dude with a Sign. And um, what he posts are pictures, and he's holding these cardboard signs with um, signs, and they, they say things that, um, you know, maybe the church is dealing with, but he does it in a comical or in a, in a funny way. And some of the signs that he's posted, they read this. Stop arguing about translations when you don't read any of them. Church didn't burn you out. Your Netflix subscription did. It's not a spiritual attack. You just make bad choices. This sign of, is about Calvinism. It won't be for everyone. You don't need to haze. You don't need to haze to bring the praise. Stop showing up halfway through worship. And then the last one that I thought was funny. He says, if 2020 was a person it would be Judas. So it's interesting how the Bible, just like these signs, describes us as these walking or these living advertisements, right? But specifically, the Word of God describes us as these living epistles, these living letters of recommendation for the faith. And, you know, I think about with everything that is happening in the world right now, you think about all the divisions, the pandemic, the, the hate, just everything that's happening overseas. I think right now, during these uncertain, scary times, we as believers, we need to be living louder than ever. And when you think about it, as believers, every single day, people around us, they're reading us. They're seeing our lives. And whatever our lives are showing, we want to hope that it's showing the love of Jesus Christ. And our living letters of recommendation are specifically for the faith. And we have to ask ourselves the, the question, you know, what is my life reading? What is this letter showing people around me? And sometimes that can be a hard question to ask because it might require some change. It might require um, some work. And, um, and sometimes we don't want to do those things. Um, however, the word of God is, is very clear um, that we want to be living that example. And he's giving us a command, and it's a great commission, the things that we're supposed to be doing before he comes uh, back to this earth. So these are a few things that we're going to be addressing this morning as we get into the Word of God um, together. So there are three specific things I'm going to talk about. Number one, I'm going to talk about the Great Commission. Number two, I'm going to talk about the fact that we are living letters of recommendation. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is what attracts people to Jesus? 
So what attracts people to Jesus? So just a little bit of a background here. If you remember here in the letter to the Corinthians, if you think back to the first letter to the Corinthians, remember there Paul is addressing some issues at a church that he fathered back during his second missionary journey. And if you look at the book of Acts there in chapter 18, it'll talk a little bit about that. And he wrote this letter from Ephesus, that first letter. Um, it was during his third missionary journey. And in the first letter, the Apostle Paul was addressing many, many issues that were taking place there at the church in Corinth. This was a church that was blessed by the Lord, but they were very carnal in the way that they were living. Um, they were having a lot of behavioral issues. They were questioning his apostleship. There was a lot of pride. There was sexual immorality taking place there in the church. And Paul had to tell them to correct a brother in Christ. That was their sin. There was also false teaching. There was an abuse of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, specifically the gift of tongues. And there was a great lack of love for one another. There was just so many issues taking place there. And then in this second letter that we're going to talk about this morning, a portion of it, um, he addresses some lingering issues and specifically false teaching that was taking place there um, at the church. These false teachers, these so-called Judaizers, and we'll talk about the Judaizers in just a little bit, they were questioning Paul's apostleship and they were causing a lot of confusion there. So now getting into the study, um, the first thing we're going to look at this morning is the Great Commission, the Great Commission. And, um, you know, currently in the, in the youth group, we're going through the Gospel of Luke. And um, a few weeks ago, when we were in the second chapter there in the Gospel of Luke, we talked about the birth of Jesus Christ. And um, if you look at John 1.1, 1, 1, right, the Word of God tells us there, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then if you look at John 1, 14, a little bit later there in the chapter, it says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So there we see that promise that the Lord himself would become flesh, speaking of Jesus. And that very event there is recorded in the Gospel of Luke, among other places. But as you read there to the Gospel of Luke, and as we did in the youth group, there are three individuals that testify of Jesus. Okay, Number one, you have the shepherds. If you look at Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20, we also have an individual named Simeon. In Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 35, and then we have Anna. There in Luke chapter 2, Verses 36 through 38. And what's interesting about the shepherds, about Simeon, and about Anna, is that there are three things that take place with these individuals. Number one, they see salvation. So the shepherds see Jesus in the manger. Simeon and Anna, if you remember, they see Jesus there in the temple in Jerusalem when his parents were dedicating him to the Lord. The second thing we see happening with these individuals is that they give thanks to the Lord after seeing salvation. Okay, Remember that the shepherds, when they saw Jesus, they glorified and they praised the Lord for all they had seen and all that they had heard. Um, Simeon blesses the Lord, and then Anna gives thanks to the Lord. And then the third thing that we see happening after they see salvation, after they thank the Lord, is that they tell others about it. The shepherds made it widely known about this child, speaking of Jesus. And then Simeon prophesied to Mary and to Joseph about this child. And then Anna prophesied to those that were looking for the redemption of Israel. So this is very interesting here, um, what we learn for these individuals. They see salvation, they give thanks to the Lord, and then they tell others about it. And similarly, as believers, followers of Jesus Christ as Christians, we have seen a similar progression in our own walk, right? All of us in this room, if you've given your life to the Lord, you've seen salvation. And uh, maybe you say to yourself, oh, but I haven't seen Jesus face to face. Well, that's true. You haven't seen him face to face. But if you put your faith in that gospel message, right? Number one, that Jesus died for our sins. Number two, that Jesus was buried. 
Number three, that he rose from the dead three days later. You put your faith in that message. You recognize you're a sinner. There's that element of repentance in your life. That, the Word of God tells us in the book of Romans, makes us righteous in the sight of God. So all of us have tasted and we've seen salvation by putting our faith in that gospel message. But also, we've seen salvation through his word, through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. And even prayer, right? Because those are the things that have changed our lives. Those are the things that have made us look more and more um, like Jesus. So just like these individuals, we've seen salvation. And we've also given thanks to the Lord for that salvation. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure you, if you guys are in the same boat as me. But I'm pretty grateful for the hope and the future that I have in Christ Jesus. And the fact that the best is still yet to come, right? This is not the end. And um, the fact that we have that hope and we have that future. And also the fact that we're free from the bondage of sin. We're free from those things that used to keep us um, from the Lord. And just like the shepherds, Simeon and Anna, now we have to tell others about Jesus, just like they do. We need to testify of him and tell as many, many people as we can about salvation. And we need to make a way for his second coming. Just like John the Baptist made for his first coming, our responsibility is to make a way for Jesus' second coming. Because he's coming back. He's coming back soon. You don't know when he's coming back. Not even Jesus himself knows when he's coming back. Only the Father knows. And we want to make sure that um, we live in those, in those times or we live in such a way that we, we can think he can come back at any minute, right? That imminent return of the Lord. That way we can tell as many people as we can. And in fact, the Lord commands us. If you look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, the word of God tells us there, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then if you look at the Gospel of Mark, verse uh, 15 in the 16th chapter, it says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So this is our calling. This is the Great Commission, right? It's not the Great Suggestion, but it's the Great Commission. And all of us in this room, we have gifts, we have talents. We're going to spread the gospel in different ways using those gifts and those talents. And the Lord has given us everything that we need to do that. Through the power and the person of his Holy Spirit, he'll manifest whatever he desires through us to spread that gospel message. And as we're doing this, we're literally these living letters of recommendation for the faith. The way we're living our lives, people are going to see that. So that leads us into our second point this morning and into our text. And I'll read this in just a second to us. We are living letters of recommendation. We are living letters of recommendation. So before we can vocalize the gospel, ultimately, we have to learn how to live like the gospel lives, right? And we need to live it every single day. And when I think about the Great Commission, you know, in my own life, um, we may not always have the opportunity to share the gospel that are around us, but we do have the opportunity to live the gospel with the people that are around us. And I heard it once said, our lives are the only Bible some people will ever read. Christians are to be living epistles or letters written by God and read by men. And this actually leads into our, our text this morning here in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, beginning in verse 17, and then we'll read all the way through chapter 3, um, verses 1 through 3. So here the Apostle Paul, he writes, uh, For we do not market the word of God for profit like so many. On the contrary, we speak with sincerity in Christ as from God and before God. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need like some letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are Christ's letter delivered by us, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. Amen. So letters of recommendation, right? 
Now, when you think about that time, um, Christians often traveled, okay? And they taught, and many of them carried these epistles or these letters of commendation, and they would say, like, the apostle so-and-so has sent me. But unfortunately, some of these false teachers that had infiltrated the church there in Corinth were also possessing, or they had some of these letters of recommendation or these letters of commendation. But Paul makes it very clear here um, that he and those that were truly doing the Lord's work, they didn't need these letters of recommendation. But rather, the Corinthians themselves, their changed lives were their living letters of recommendation. And I love how G. Campbell Morgan puts this. He says, they, the Corinthians, were the epistle or the letter of Christ. The author and the writer of the living epistle is Christ. The pen or instrument is the Apostle Paul. The ink or means of accomplishing the revelation is the Spirit. So their changed lives, they validated Paul's apostleship. They validated Paul's ministry. And the Lord was working through Paul, and the Lord was also working in the lives of these individuals, these Corinthian Christians. So in fact, if you look at the first letter there, Paul writes to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, there it says, Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, Verbally abusive people or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So changed lives are the biggest thing that you and I can show for a life in Jesus Christ, right? Our testimony. Right? Our testimonies, um, which is the fruit of true repentance, those are the things that show our changed life, life in Jesus Christ, right? Turning from our sin and turning to the Lord. And not just being sorry for being caught sinning, but truly being sorry enough to make that 180 degree turn and change our lives around. Not going in the direction of sin, but going in the direction that the Lord is pulling us. And when I think about repentance, there are three things that come to my mind. Number one, confession. Okay, When we mess up, which is going to be every single day, right? because we always fall short of God's glory, the Word of God tells us in 1 John 1, 9, and I like to call this the, the Christian bar of soap, it says, if we confess our sins, He, the Lord, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The second element of repentance should be a contrite heart or a crushed heart. And I'll reference Psalm 51 in just a little bit here. Um, the third thing we also have to see when it comes to repentance is a conversion, a conversion rather, or an element of change in our lives. Where we make that 180 degree turn from the original direction we're going and we're going in the direction of the Lord. Now, when it comes to true repentance, the Lord examines our heart. It's not this outward appearance. But rather, he looks at our heart. Changed hearts are a true evidence or are the true evidence of repentance, right? And when our hearts are changed, it takes care of the rest. Okay? And when it comes to that broken and contrite heart, it reminds me of Psalm 51. And, you know, I think Pastor Angel uh, taught on this recently. There in First Samuel, I'm sorry, Second Samuel, I think it's in chapter 12 and 13. Um, remember there, David, um, he's confronted by the prophet Nathan for his, um, his act of adultery with Bathsheba and also the fact that he tried to cover up his sin and that led to the death of her husband Uriah. If you remember, he tried to cover up his sin um, by bringing back Uriah from the battlefield and twice he tried to have Uriah go spend time with his wife. To make him believe that that child that was actually David was actually his, but it really wasn't. It was David's child. And then at the end of the day, David ends up sending Uriah at the forefront of one of the hottest battles 
and he ends up dying. And when he's confronted by Nathan, David is completely crushed by his sinful act. And in fact, here in Psalm 51, um, if you read the whole psalm, um, beautiful psalm, uh, very, um, you know, you can, you can feel the pain that he has for, for the bloodshed that was, that was on his hands. But here in verse 16 and verse 17, it says, You do not want a sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humble heart, God. So this is what the Lord looks for. He looks for a broken and a humble heart. And it's a broken and a humble heart that's going to lead to repentance. It's going to lead to a change in our life, just like it did in the life of David, right? He wasn't unusable anymore, but now he was usable by the Lord. And we see that as we continue reading about the life of David in the Word of God. You see, the thing is, God never intended to meet us in salvation and for us to be strangers until we stand before him in glory. We want to keep walking with the Lord since the beginning, since we come to him, right? It's not that we come to the Lord and we kind of forget about him until we see him face to face. No, we keep walking with the Lord. We keep abiding in the Lord. And that'll help us to continue walking in that uh, path of repentance. There should be a change in our lives. And it's repentance, true repentance, that shapes our testimony. And when you think about your testimony, you know, our testimonies are very, very powerful. They're extremely unique. I, I can guarantee you there's nobody on the face of the planet that has the same exact testimony as you do. They might have a similar one, but it's not the same exact testimony. And I think sometimes, and I don't know if you've done this, but maybe there's a testimony night and we like to rank our testimonies. We're like, oh, wow, his testimony is so much more interesting than mine. Or, no, mine's not an interesting testimony. But um, the truth of the matter is that testimony should be the most important thing to you because that's the proof of life. The, the proof of God changing your life. The proof of the fact that the Lord has come into your life. So we have to really value our testimonies. Um, sometimes people call them our boastimonies, but really it's our testimonies, right? Boasting in the Lord, not in ourselves, but the fact that the Lord did that work. And when I think about changed lives, you know, we're reading this letter written by the Apostle Paul. That guy really had a changed life, right? You think about him, for example, in the book of Acts. If you look there in, in Acts chapter 9, you know, the Apostle Paul, before he was the Apostle Paul, was Saul of Tarsus, right? He was a terrorist. He used to terrorize the early church. And if you remember there in Acts chapter 9, he was on his way to um, Damascus, right? And he was going there to persecute and to drag back Christians in chains to Jerusalem for the purpose of persecution. Um, but then he has this encounter with the Lord, right? He sees salvation, and this changes his life forever. Um, eventually, he makes his way into Damascus, but not as a persecutor of Jesus Christ, but rather he becomes an advocate for Jesus Christ. Now he's for the Lord. And if you remember how he left Damascus, he left as this humble servant, right, in a basket through a hole in the wall that surrounded Damascus. And there we see a truly, truly a change in a life there, right? He's initially a terrorist, and then now he's this humble servant before the Lord that would face so many trials and so many difficulties for the Lord's sake. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. And all of us, like I said, we have our own testimonies, and um, they're unique, just like Paul's here. And just like Paul and the Corinthians, our lives are these living letters of recommendation um, for the faith. Every single day, people are reading you, they're reading me, they're reading our letters. And I love what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, there in the 12th verse. He tells us that we have to continuously examine ourselves. And when I think about that as a living letter, um, a living epistle, it's almost saying like you're, you're reading your life over and over again. You know, what is your life saying? What is your life reading? Right? What are people reading when they see you, when they're around you? You know, are they reading, like, the Inquirer? Are they reading the sports page? Are they reading conspiracy theories? What are they reading when they read your life? What does your life say about your walk with Christ? And what's in our heart is eventually going to become a part of our character. So it's really what's in our heart is, is what's going to change us. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit. And, um, you know, this is something that we've actually been talking a little bit about in the men's group on, on Wednesdays. You know, we're currently going through the book of Genesis. 
And in those first few chapters in Genesis, the Lord, he gives us this blueprint for headship in the home and also a blueprint for marriage in the home. And, you know, we were talking and, you know, the men agree, you know, those are things that we need to be living louder than ever in this time. Just because the world right now has corrupted marriage, has corrupted this headship in the family, has twisted things around and has caused confusion. And these are the things we need to be living out loud. And it, it's not that, you know, we're, we're going, it's not that we have hate towards anyone, but rather we want to live what the gospel is telling us to live. And if people don't take it um, right or they're offended, then that is the word of God doing the offending, right? It's not you or it's not me, but it's rather the word of God living through us and speaking through us. So the thing is, we need to be radical for the Lord. We need to be radical for the Lord. And, you know, so many people right now, including, unfortunately, some of our brothers and sisters in Christ, um, are being radical for the things of the world and not so much radical for the things of the Lord. And, you know, sometimes people are radical for a politician or they're radical for, you know, you need to wear a mask or you don't need to wear a mask. You know, they're radical for like the most recent conspiracy YouTube video that you need to see right away because they're going to take it down. You know, they're radical for the things that, um, you know, we need, we don't want to be radical for, right? The, the chaos that this pandemic is causing, the chaos of the world that's falling apart around us because they feel that's the Christian thing to do. But the truth of the matter is we only need to be radical for the Lord and nothing else. And when I think about a radical person in scripture, and, um, you know, just because I've been spending a lot of time in Luke with, with the young people, um, John the Baptist, that guy was pretty radical. He was different. And um, like I said, we were talking about him. We've been talking about him in, in the youth group. And, you know, John the Baptist is he, he's a pretty interesting guy. If you think about him. Um, if you look in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 3, I, I think it's in, yeah, it's in verse 4, um, it tells us that this is a guy that was clothed in camel hair. He wore a leather belt. He ate locusts and honey. And um, when I picture John the Baptist, um, and even some of the historical um, representations that we see of him, like pictures and stuff like that, um, I, I often think of like, like maybe he was like a hippie or something, you know? He was this person in the wilderness making a way for the Lord's first coming. But the thing with John the Baptist, his ministry had two elements to it. Okay, if you look in the Gospel of Luke chapter 3, he was preaching repentance and he was also baptizing. Okay, that outward symbol of repentance. And repentance then and even now, it's something that can be very uncomfortable because repentance requires change, right? And for many of us, Change is bad, right? We don't want to change the way we're living. We want to keep living in the way that we, um, we want to choose. Turning from the world and turning to God, making that 180 degree turn can be very painful, right? Oh no, I, I can't stop living like that. No, you don't understand. I ha you don't understand the situation I'm in. I have to live like this, right? And I think the biggest issue is that the way we live and maybe even our self-worth, right? We find it in those things that fill those voids. When the only person that can fill that void and satisfy that void is Jesus. And those are things that we have to kind of think about and, and, um, and just kind of apply to our lives. And I always tell these young people, you know, your self-worth is found in Jesus Christ. It's not found in anything else. And I think that's um, something the world tells them is that their self-worth is found in all these other things, not in Jesus Christ. And that's where all of this repentance and difficult having a difficult time to repent comes from. And interestingly, despite the fact that John was radical for the Lord, you know, he was preaching this unusual message of repentance. People were actually attracted to John. They would follow him. They would come to him. He had many disciples. And, you know, this was a guy that didn't preach in the temple. He didn't perform any miracles, right? Um, what was it about him that attracted people to him? Well, you know, I truly believe it was this message that God had given to him, a message of hope, a message that people that were unsatisfied in their current state could look to and could hold on to. And this is the very message that you and I have, all of us that have given our lives to the Lord, right? This message of hope, the gospel message, right? Number one, that Jesus died for our sins, that Jesus was buried, that Jesus rose from the dead, right? We put our faith in that message. Um, we recognize we're sinners. There's that element of repentance, right? That's what makes us righteous in the sight of God. 
that gives us that hope and that everlasting life, that future in, in Christ Jesus, right? And this message, unfortunately, is a message that is very different from any message the world wants to hear, right? It's a message that goes against the flow of the world right now. Um, but just like John the Baptist, as believers, we want to be different. We want to go against that flow. And um, the mind picture that I always get when I think about this is, um, and maybe you've seen this before, but salmon. Salmon, um, they like to spawn or lay their eggs in, um, you know, in the rocks, but they go upstream. They go against the flow. And I don't, I don't know if you've seen this, but um, you'll have like a waterfall coming this way. And they're like jumping against the waterfall. They're going against the flow, going against the water. And the current is strong, but they're still like they're doing every effort they can to get up there to spawn or to lay their eggs. And that's the way we should be as believers, going against the flow of this world, preaching the gospel, living the gospel, planting that seed wherever we find ourselves. That way more and more people can come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. And yes, it's hard to go against the flow sometimes, especially because of the many liberties that we have as believers, right? Um, and Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12, he says that not all are profitable, speaking of the liberties that we have as believers. We don't want to be mastered or under the influence by anything. So sometimes we're going to have to give up something for the purposes of doing that. But it's worth it because it's for the Lord's sake. You know, Pastor Chuck used to always say, you have one life that will soon be passed, but only what's done for Christ will last. And that's, you know, that's the heart we want to have doing everything we can for the Lord to build his kingdom, to point as many people to Jesus so they have that hope that we have. But what's interesting about the world, and maybe not so interesting about the world, is that people are so loud about their sin. Even Christians, believe it or not, you hear some of the things believers say, and it, it's hard to hear this, but um, instead of being so loud about our sin, we need to be loud about our salvation. We don't want to be hypocrites. We don't want to give people the opportunity to blaspheme the name of the Lord because of the way we're living. And when I think about my own life and the fact that, you know, I'm a living letter, I'm a living epistle for the faith, you know, I'm constantly examining my life. And um, it makes me think back to those, those days when I was writing, um, I was writing my, my dissertation um, and my master's uh, for, my, for my graduate degrees. You know, I, I remember writing this thing and like having to revise it and, and to change words and to take sentences out and add things to it. And um, same thing with our lives. We have to remove things from our lives, habits, addictions, strongholds. And we have to add things to our lives, you know. And, and the thing is, what are we adding to our lives? Are we adding the likeness of the world? Or are we adding the likeness of Jesus Christ to our lives? And that's something we, we want to be careful of. Ultimately, we want our lives, these living letters of recommendation, to read like the Word of God, right? The only representation we have of God the Father is Jesus Christ himself, right? That's what Jesus told Philip in John chapter 14, verse 9, right? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So we want our lives to look like the word of God because that word of God gives us um, an insight to what Jesus was like, who he is, what he's like, and how he lives. And that should be our blueprint as far as what our letters should read, what our letters should look like. We want people to be attracted to Jesus and not to us. And remember, the Holy Spirit will always point people to Jesus. John 15, 26 tells us, When the Counselor comes, speaking of the Holy Spirit, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. So the Holy Spirit will always point people to Jesus. And that's why our lives should always point people to Jesus, because we want to be more like Jesus, but also the fact that we're filled with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God has given us that blueprint. Um, that's what we want to be doing. So then the question becomes, what attracts people to Jesus? And that's our third point this morning. What is it specifically that attracts people um, to Jesus? And I want you to think about this for a little bit. And, um, you know, what do you think it was about Jesus that attracted people to him? Was it the healing? Was it the miracles? Um, it was the food. I don't know. The young people were like, it was the food. No. Um, you know, it, maybe it was all those things. But what was it about him that attracted people to him? You know, what's interesting is if you look at Isaiah in the 53rd chapter there in verse 2, there Isaiah 
prophetically gives us a description about Jesus. And there Isaiah writes, he says, There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, speaking of Jesus. Nothing to attract us to him. So here, prophetically, Isaiah is telling us that Jesus um, was not attractive. He didn't have this beauty that attracted people to him, right? And remember that Jesus is the only living example we have of God the Father. And if you look at 1 John 4, 8, the Word of God tells us there that God is love. That love, that word love there, that agape love, is that sacrificial love. And I truly believe it was out of that sacrificial love that came the healing, the miracles, the compassion, and all that, you know, the food, of course, that Jesus, as he said, the, the crowds and, and the miracles that he performed, right? And ultimately, the willingness to surrender to the will of his Father and lay down his life, right, for you and for me and for all and for anyone and for everyone who will believe, right? And always attending to the greatest needs. Um, that was the life of Jesus. And ultimately, it is the love of Christ, this agape love, um, that is going to attract people to Jesus. And when I think about this love, you know, it is this love that the Lord has given to us through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. A love that gives us the desire to surrender to his will and ultimately shapes our lives, right? It revises our living letters of recommendation. It changes us. Because if you don't love God, you're not going to submit to God and your life is not going to change. You have to love him first. So in other words, our testimonies, our changed lives are all rooted from the love of God. The love that the Lord has given to us and the love that we are now pouring out and giving to others around us. Right? That's what attracts people to Christ. And this love, I love how Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Um, if you look there, beginning in verse 4, he's speaking of this agape love. He says, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not, it is not self-seeking, it is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So that is the love that the Lord can manifest and has manifested in us through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. Now every single day, like I said before, we're going to fall short of God's glory. The Word of God tells us this in the book of Romans. Right? We're not going to be sinless, but we should desire to sin less, right? And that same love and mercy that God has given to us, you know, as we confess our sins to Him, is the same love and mercy that we need to show towards people around us, including people that are not the same. And that's a hard one. Ephesians 4.32, Paul tells us, And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God also forgave you. In Christ, and of course, there he's speaking to the church there in Ephesus. But this is applicable to everybody now, and I actually believe this is even more applicable to the people that are not in the faith. Right? We want to show that love. Now, we have to be careful though, because love is not tolerance, right? And I think we live in a world where it's all about tolerance, right? And people think it's love, and we have to be careful because church, that's not love. If you truly love someone, you're not going to tolerate something. You're going to love them enough to turn them to the Lord so that there's a change in their life. Because if you're just tolerating it, you really don't love them because they're going to be the same person. And we want them to know Jesus and to be with Jesus. And I know that this, is a, this can be a difficult thing because we want people to come to salvation. But remember that we can change people. Only God can. And we want to remain faithful praying for people, you know, sometimes we get to a point where we're like, you know what, I'm just going to stop praying for that person. They're never going to come to the Lord. Well, you know what, the Lord's timing has never been my timing. So we have to keep praying for them and keep witnessing to them and keep living the gospel whenever you're with them, because that's what we're called to do. And when we don't do that, um, we can push them further away from God, right? Remember, love is not tolerance, right? And when we do that, this keeps us from adding the likeness of the world into our lives, into our letters, but rather allows us to add the likeness of the Lord into our lives and into these living letters of recommendation for the faith. Okay. 
So kind of wrapping up here in closing, I wanna I want us to think about our lives, our living letters of recommendation for the faith. Okay. And you know, one question I want to ask, and, and you know, this is this is a hard one because it's also kind of it kind of pierced me, you know. Are we dividing the church right now, or are we uniting the church right now? You know, there's so many issues. Um, another question you want to think about, are we blending in with the world right now, or are we pointing people to Jesus right now in our lives? So those are things you want to think about. And I want to give you four tools, four instruments um, that will allow you to revise the letter, the living letter of recommendation um, for the faith that you are living right now, okay, in Christ Jesus. So. Um, how do we live a life that reflects Jesus? We need to speak the Lord's faith, right? Um, and how do we do that? Well, we have four tools. We have four instruments. Number one, we have the Word of God, right? The Book of Romans tells us there in the 10th chapter that the Word, um, I'm sorry, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, right? All of His promises, all the things that He has done and yet to do are in His Word. The word of God is a reflection of who he is, right? And I love how Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 13, right? Sometimes they refer to it as a mirror of God's word. And right now we only see the Lord in this unclear, dim image, right? But every time we get into the word of God, he becomes more and more clear to us. And the more clear he becomes to us, um, it's, it's easier for us to understand how it is we're supposed to be living, right? And... Um, God's word will always have something for us. Whether you're going through a divorce, whether you're going through a time of difficulty, whether you're sick in body, you're going through a time of depression, um, or maybe you're going through one of the most joyful times in your life right now, the word of God will always have something um, for us, right? And um, I love that. And that's why we have to be intimate with the word of God. The second tool we have is the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, right? Ephesians chapter 5, there beginning in the 15th verse, um, you know, Paul tells us to, to be walking circumspectly, right? Redeeming the time, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. He says to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Not to be drunk with wine or with things that, you know, have dissipation, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? And we don't want to be under the influence of anything other than the Holy Spirit. And in fact, if you look there in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, um, there's a great example of, of that in the life of Jesus. If you remember, Jesus, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he was led into the wilderness, right, for 40 days where he was tempted by the enemy. And, you know, because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was able to escape the tactics of the enemy and then eventually make his way um, back to Galilee. And that same spirit that Jesus had is the same spirit that lives in you, that lives in me, that lives in the church, right? The existence of God in this earth right now is the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus isn't here right now, right? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He'll be here soon. I don't know when he's coming, but I'm looking forward to that. But truly the Holy Spirit allows us to submit to God. That way we can resist the devil and that way he can flee from us, right? And that way we can live that life. That represents uh, Jesus Christ, the Lord. The third tool we have is prayer. And, um, you know, unfortunately, this is a tool that's not utilized enough, I think, as believers. We need to pray more. We need to encourage one another to pray more. You know, I think about prayer gatherings. Those tend to be the least attended um, church gatherings or events, whatever you want to call them. And, um, you know, that should be a burden to us because prayer is so powerful. Um, this is our communication with God. God can also communicate and reveal himself to us through prayer. It's our dependence on the Father. And I think sometimes when we think about prayer, we think like we have to have this special setting and, you know, there has to be, you know, smoke and fog and like synthesizers. It, it has nothing to do with that. It's the setting of your heart. And it can be so simple. You know, I think about Peter when he was thinking in the Sea of Galilee, right? He said three words, save me, Lord. And the Lord saved him. Um, you can pray anywhere, right? Remember Jonah prayed in the belly of a large fish. Um, Daniel prayed in the lion's den. We can pray from anywhere. You can pray while you're driving. Don't close your eyes, right? You can pray anywhere, right? We have the ability um, to do this. And, you know, we've been talking about this in, in the youth group, you know, going through the, going through the gospel of Luke. And um, many, many times in there, the prayer life of Jesus is displayed. He would often go away 
and spend time with the Father um, in prayer. And in fact, if you look there in the 11th chapter in the Gospel of Luke, he taught his disciples to pray. He didn't teach them how to preach. He didn't teach them how to perform miracles. He taught them how to pray. And um, like I said, this is a tool that we need to utilize. We need to use more in our, in our walk. And then lastly, we have fellowship. And fellowship with other believers is extremely important. And I think with the pandemic, we, many of us learn that. Being away from other believers, being away from the church for extended periods of time can put us in a very dangerous position or a very dangerous place. So fellowship leads to encouragement. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 tells us, We and others can use the same comfort that the Lord has provided for them in difficulty to comfort others in similar situations, right? So we desperately need each other. Your situations, the way the Lord has ministered to you, can help another brother or sister in Christ. And when we use these tools, we utilize these tools, we can add the likeness of Jesus Christ into our lives, and we can remove the likeness of the world in our lives. And we can be those living letters of recommendation for the faith and properly represent the Lord. You know, I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, verses 15 through 16. There he says, For to God we are the fragrance of Christ among those who faith, and among those who are perishing. To some we are the aroma of death leading to death, but to others an aroma of life leading to life. So our heart should be that wherever we are, we leave behind that fragrance of the Lord Jesus Christ. That way, many, many more people can come to knowledge of Him. Now, remember what the Lord taught us, the Apostle Paul, in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. Okay, so here he's speaking to the church. He says, Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit, through the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. At your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all in all. Once again, the Lord speaking through Paul, speaking to the church here, urging for unity. But I truly believe that when the world sees this, this is what will attract them to the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you're joining us here in person or maybe via the live stream or you come across this video at a later time and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we want to give you that opportunity um, this morning. And maybe you're struggling with sin. Maybe you're, you're dealing with situations in your life that you're just you're tired. You want to give it to the Lord. You want to find a solution to all the problems in your life. Um, we want to give you that opportunity this morning. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, bow your head, and, and repeat this prayer um, after me. Lord Jesus, this morning, I want to invite you into my life as my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died. I believe that you were buried. And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I also recognize, Lord, that I am a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change me and use me for your glory. All these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, we want to welcome you to um, the family of Christ. And uh, if you have any questions, maybe you want um, some guidance on what the next steps are, uh, please reach out to the church. You can leave a comment there in the um in the comment section if you're watching via the live stream. And of course, if you're here in person, uh, you can come up after the service for prayer, for whatever that you, whatever it is that you need. And um, like I said, we're here to serve um, each other, one another. So let me go ahead and close in prayer, and then um, we'll have one more song. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the privilege of knowing you and the fact, Lord, that we're these living epistles, we're these living letters of recommendation for the faith that you would choose to use people like us, Lord God, to advance your message, Lord, to advance the hope that we have in you. We thank you so much for that privilege, Lord, and that opportunity, Lord. It's so important. It's so valuable, Lord God, and it should be priceless to us. And we pray, Lord, this morning that as we 
venture out of here as we go into our week, Lord, that you would continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us that desire to get into your word, Lord, to pray, Lord, to, to be in fellowship, Lord, to just be desperate for you, Lord God. That way we can show people around us what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for your love and your compassion. And once again, Lord, we pray that you would give us rest as we, um, you know, we, we observe Labor Day um, tomorrow, Lord. Help us to just rest in your peace and know that you're God, Lord, and help us to just be still and know that, Lord. We thank you so much for this time. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.